Hello, this is Dr. James Camp at Lee College in Baytown, Texas, and these are my thoughts on Chapter 5, Loops and Files, of Starting Out with C++ by Tony Gaddis. Okay, so Gaddis starts out by introducing two operators that uh, get used an awful lot in looping, um, the increment and decrement operators. Uh, in C and all of the C-derived languages, uh, C++, C Sharp, uh, Java, uh, the uh, JavaScript, this plus plus is an integral part of the language. The idea is that you can substitute, instead of having to type out the phrase val equals val plus one, you can just put val plus plus and that plus plus operator adds one to whatever number is stored in the memory location val. Okay, plus plus can be used either before or after and it's a sort of an important distinction but a little hard one, you know, a harder one to keep track of sometimes. If you put plus plus before the variable that increments the value before it gets used in that line. If you put plus plus after the variable, it increments the value after it is used on that line. Another way of putting that is to say, oh, and uh, minus minus, sorry, skipped ahead of myself. Uh, minus minus is the decrement operator. It has exactly the same effect, but in reverse. Instead of writing val equals val minus one, you can put val minus minus, and it will subtract one from whatever value is there in memory and uh, re return the value minus one. Uh, minus minus val decrements before it's used, val minus minus after it is used. Okay, another way of putting that is in prefix mode, putting plus plus or minus minus before the variable name, the operator increments or decrements, then returns the value to that line. In postfix mode, uh, putting plus plus or minus minus after the variable, the operator returns the value, then does the increment or decrement operation. Uh, Again, if you put it before, you do the increment or decrement before it gets used on that line. If you put it after, you increment or decrement after it's been used on that line. So, for example, if we put C out val plus plus, uh, we're going to take the original value of 12, display that 12, then plus plus it, and the value ends the display was 12, but the value ends as 13. If we put the plus plus before val, we're going to set val to 14 first, then we'll display 14. Okay. So it gets incremented before it's used on that line of code. Uh, you can also use these with assignment statements. Uh, if we put minus minus ahead of value, so val remembers 14, so we're going to take one away, set it to 13, and then store 13 in the value num. Here, we're still going to store 13 in num, and we're going to minus minus it after the fact. So we'll end with, uh, we'll end this with num equals 13, val equals 12. If that's a little confusing to you, um, it is to most beginning C programmers. You just have to practice using it both ways and see what effect it has on your programs. Okay, this can result in some pretty complicated expressions. Um, if we said result equals num1 plus plus and then minus minus num2, uh, what is result going to be? Well, uh, if num1 starts as uh, 
1 and num2 starts as 2, then we're going to use num1 before we add to it. We're going to use, we're going to decrement 2 uh, 2 to 1, okay, before we use it. So that's 1 plus 1 and result gets the value of 2. After we've already done that, we're going to boost 1 to 2. Okay, so some of this is a little difficult to follow at first. Must be applied to something that has a location in memory. Okay, you can't use plus plus as part of an expression. Okay, um, as part of a, a complex expression. So you can't plus plus the result of num1 plus num2. You could, num, you could plus plus each of them, but, um, but this is a no-no. Um, it can be used in relational expressions. Okay, imagine if plus plus num greater than limit. Now, thought experiment here, how is that different than num plus plus greater than limit? Uh, answer, this one we're going to increment first before we compare to limit. This one, we're going to compare num and limit, and then we're going to increment the number. Okay, so now that we know about incrementing and decrementing numbers, which, as I said, is kind of an important uh, bread and butter part of doing loops, uh, because a lot of times we want to add one or subtract one or add a certain number or subtract a certain number while going through a loop. Um, let's talk about the most basic kind of loop, a while loop. A loop is a control structure that causes a statement or statements to repeat. And it's, it's named after the way it looks on a flowchart. Control comes back to, you know, control hits a, a control point here and then it loops, uh, it loops back to where it started, and then eventually it exits the loop and continues forward. Okay, but that re repetition here resembles a, uh, a car driving around a loop or something. Um, the general format of the while loop in C uh, almost every language has some equivalent of a while loop at this point, and it works like this. While, in C, you have to put it in parentheses, some true-false expression, uh, if expression is true, we, or as long as while the expression is true, we repeat the statement. Um, of course, in C++, anytime you have a state, single statement, you could also have a block of statements enclosed in curly brackets. So this is what a while look, loop looks like in logic. The uh, control of the program hits an inflection point here. We check an expression. If the expression is true, we carry out the statement that belongs to that loop. We return to our control point. Then we test the expression again. If it's true, we repeat the statements again and come back to our control point. As soon as that statement is false, however, we leave the loop and continue on down the, uh, the path of the program. Okay. Here's how this works in sort of internal logic. The expression, whatever we consider our expression here to be, um, color is 
red maybe, uh, that expression is evaluated. Uh, and, you know, let's let's talk about that for a second as if this were a, a sort of real life loop. Um, while white is red, this is one you've probably done in your car if you are old enough to drive. Um, while light is red, step on the brake pedal. So here's how this works. We, we evaluate the expression first. Um, we look up through the windshield of our car and see that the light is red. So we, uh, we execute the statement. We step on the brake pedal. Then we come back and we check, is the light still red? If it is, we continue to step on the brake pedal. And that continues, that loop of logic continues until eventually the light turns green. Okay, when the light is no longer red, when the light is no longer red, then we exit the loop and um, we might go to another instruction called step on the accelerator pedal, okay? Uh, so this is basic while loop logic. Okay, this number, this uh, program here, simple program demonstrates how you would uh, set up a program to write hello five times. You start with a counter, number equals one, you check is number less than or equal to five? It is. One is less than or equal to five. So we count hello. We, we see out hello. We add one to the number. Number is now two. Still less than or equal to five. So we come back through this. Number is now three. You can see we would repeat this several times. Eventually number plus plus gets us up to six, okay, and when number is six, that breaks us out of the loop and takes us down to the next line, at, you know, the first line after the loop, which prints that's all. And you can see the results of this down here. Hello, 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 hello. And then we finally get kicked out of the loop. That's all. All right. Uh, so this just explains how that number works. We've, we've been through this already, so I'm going to pass through this. Okay. And this is a flow chart explaining the same thing. Um, number starts out as 1. Is number less than 5? Print hello, though it was less than or equal to 5 in the previous example. Um, add 1 to number. Number is now 2, still less than 5, so we go around again. 3, still less than 5, go around again. 4, okay. You see how this continues. 5 is still less than or equal to 5. Eventually, we go through this loop enough times to have 6. 6 is not less than or equal to 5, so that kicks us out of the loop and we continue on with the program. Okay, the while loop is what we know as a pre-test loop. Okay, the expression testing the loop is evaluated before the loop executes. So, ask yourself, will this following loop ever execute? Okay, we start with number equals 6, while number less than or equal to 5. Okay, number is not less than or equal to 5, it's 6. So that immediately kicks us out of the loop. We never have any output from this loop. 
we would never get the C out hello. Um, the opposite of a loop like we just looked at that never executes is a loop that continues forever. Okay, the loop has to contain code that eventually makes the expression become false. Otherwise, the loop will have no way of stopping. And that loop, a loop that continues on an infinite number of times, is called an infinite loop. Uh, making fun of this little bit of programming terminology, Apple's corporate headquarters in California is on a circular drive called infinite loop. Um, so. Uh, an example of an infinite loop, we initialize number to be equal to 1. We say while number is less than or equal to 5. See out hello. Come back over here. Oh, oops. Um, number is still equal to 1. We left out the code that updates number each time. And so this, this loop will be, will run as many times as we allow it to because it will never change the value of number. Okay, a couple of quick uses for while loops. One is called input validation. This is where uh, you read an item of input. While the input is invalid, you ask the user to input the variable again. Usually you try to display some sort of a useful error message explaining why that input was invalid, otherwise you'll just get a string of bad inputs from the user. So, for example, if we're looking for a number less than 10, we say enter a number less than 10. Um, user inputs a number. While number is greater than or equal to 10, okay, that makes the, the uh, number invalid, we print an error message, invalid entry, and then we ask again for the input, enter a number less than 10. The user inputs another number. Um, we come back over here. Let's say the user entered uh, 7 this time. Then 7 is not greater than or equal to 10. So that's valid input. So that kicks us out of the loop. OK. This is a flowchart for input validation. And this is an example of a more complicated input validation. We have a minimum number of players on a team and a maximum number of players on a team, but apparently there's some flexibility in the rules of this game about how many people could be on a team. Maybe it's um, a game for six to 10 players or something like that. Um, so you, you decide how many you wish per team, but if you're either less than min players or greater than max players uh, will output a little error message here explaining what you did wrong and then we'll ask you to do your input again. Uh, and then this put this program actually has a second input down here. Uh, you ask how many players are available and while players is less than or equal to zero, um, obviously if nobody is playing, there's no point in having a game. So uh, please enter zero or greater is our error message this time. And then again, we ask for another input. Okay. Another much more common use of uh, loops in engineering at least is counters. Uh, a counter is a variable that is either incremented counting up or decremented counting down each time a loop repeats. Uh, if this is being used to control how many times we execute the loop, then this counter is also known as a loop control variable. Um, if it's going to be used as a loop control variable, it has to be initialized before entering the loop because again, these are pre-test loop. Uh, these while loops are pre-test loops. You have to have some value before you can enter uh, so here, if we want to count from one to 10 and do something in this case, just take the square of a number. Um, we start by initializing these variables up here. Min number is one, max number equals 10. 
and num, the one we're counting, starts at min number. So we've, we've initialized the counter right there. Then we say while num less than or equal to max number, note we're going to num plus plus here to make sure that we don't have an infinite loop. Okay, we're going to see out num and num times num and a couple of tab characters in between to space them out. And then we continue back as long as num is less than or equal to max number, we keep doing this. So we get one, two, three, four, five, etc., all the way down to 10. And when num finally feeds back with 11, that's not greater, not less than or equal to max number. So that kicks us out of the loop and we get our return zero statement. Okay. If for some reason you don't want a pretest loop, you want to make sure you do the loop at least once no matter what, you can use a do while loop, which is kind of a while loop backwards. Okay. And this is written in C++ this way. Do statement while uh, while expression. So we're going to do when we get to this, we're going to do statement at least once and then test expression to see if we should do it again. If expression is true, we'll come back and do it all over again. If expression is false, that kicks us out to uh, whatever comes after our loop. Note, a uh, little syntax note here, there is a semicolon after while expression this time. There wasn't one in the regular while loop. In fact, there can't be one in the regular while loop or you'll have errors. Okay, logic of a do while loop, program control comes through, executes statements once, then gets to expression and asks, is it true or false? As long as it's true, we come back and keep repeating. As soon as it becomes false, we leave the loop and keep on going. So uh, will this program execute? We're starting with x equal 1, and our while loop is x less than 0. Well, this loop, because we have do, because it's a do while, we'll see out x once. OK, so we'll output 1. And then we'll check while x equals 0 and find that 1 is not less than 0, and so that kicks us out of the loop and we continue on with the program. But that's why, that's what a post-test loop does for you is you'll get one run through the loop no matter whether your value is true or false. Okay, uh, one good example of how you can use this is interactive inputs, uh, an interactive input program where you're sure that you want to ask the user for input once so enter three scores, calculate the average. Then we ask, does the user want to average another set? And we input again. Um, if the user says yes, we come back and we average another three scores. If the user says no, we in this case, go to a return zero statement that exits our program. Okay, so this shows how that program would execute 80, 90, 70, the average is 80, 60, 75, 88, the average is 74.3. Then the user types in, and that ends the program for us, kicks us out of that loop. Uh, do while notes, the loop always executes at least once and the execution continues as long as expression is true. Uh, it's also useful in menu-driven programs where you want to bring the user back to the menu to make another choice. Um, so for example, like your calculator program that we've done in our, our class, you could have um, done a do while where it will 
ask the user to do one menu driven operation and then print the menu and ask them to do it again uh, at the end. Uh, the for loop. Okay. For, uh, for is an interesting loop. It's a loop with a great history. Um, in Fortran and you know it's, it's been around since Fortran and Basic and those early early programming languages. Um, the idea is that for at least one way of doing it is you know for x equals start to finish. Um, do y, okay? Um, so for x gets these values between start and finish, um, presumably counting one at a time, though some uh, languages allow you, you know, that have this format, allow you to put, you know, step 10 in instead. So we could say from, you know, if we wanted to count from 1 to 100, you know, from 0 to 100 in tens, we could say for x equals start to finish step 10, uh, in place of our do y, we could say print x, and we'd get printed 0, 10, 20, 30. Um, could you do this with a while loop? Of course you could. You could do it with a counting, a while loop with a counter. This just automates the counting for you. Uh, the C++ variant of a for loop, however, is even more powerful than that basic Fortran kind of uh, way of doing it. C++ sets you up with for and an initializer statement, a test statement, and an update statement. This is most often used simply to automate counting. So the update is usually a counting up or counting down, okay? Um, count plus plus or count plus equals 10, um, okay? But update could be something like reading a new line from a file and then um, you do something with that line in your, your for loop. So, uh, the for you know the for expression doesn't have to be used for counting in C++. It can be used for any kind of progression through uh, through a a list or a uh, you know reading through a file or all sorts of things. Note there is not there are semicolons here and here between the initialization and the test and the update, there is not a semicolon here after the update, and there is not a semicolon at the end of the line uh, before the, the statement or block. If you put a semicolon here, uh, that would cause a, an error, it would cause an empty loop. The loop would, uh, would run without any statements and then uh, you wouldn't get anything for all of your hard work. Okay. Um, how this works? First, the loop is going to perform the initialization. Okay, maybe that is in our counting from zero to 100, that would be count equals zero. Okay. Um, then it's going to do a test. Is count less than or equal to 100? Okay. Uh, then it's going to run your statement, which was in our previous thing, printing out count. So we'd say C out count. Um, and then update is going to be count, in this case, plus equals 10. We're going to do that and then go right back to test. Is count plus 10 still less than or equal 100? If it is, sure, we repeat the statement. Okay, and so this is the loop. Update, test, statement, update, test, statement, update, test, statement, until eventually 
uh, count gives us 110, and that kicks us out of the loop and, and runs us on through the rest of the program. Okay, so here's a typical for loop, um, a counting loop. So we initialize an integer called count equal to zero. We want to count as long as it's less than five and our update is plus plus. So how many times do you think this loop will print hello? Okay, um, the answer here is we're going to go through it once at count equals zero. Count less than, count, you know, see out hello. Come up here, count updates to one, still less than five. So we go again. Two, still less than five, go again three, four, and then eventually we hit five. Five is not less than five, okay? So that kicks us out of the loop, but not until we have printed hello one, two, three, four, five times. Okay, so this explains the, the four steps of a C++ loop. And this is how that looks in a uh, flowchart. Now, you'll notice that this flowchart, we initialize to zero, we check count less than five, we do our C out statement, we increment count, we come back here to start again. We could do that with a while loop. We'd just have to add to our program, we'd have to write this initializer and we'd have to write this increment statement. Uh, the uh, the for loop never does anything that we couldn't do with a while loop. It just makes it easier to automate the initialization and the increment steps. Okay, so here's our printing out the squares thing again. This time we initialize min number and max number, but we don't have to initialize num because we're gonna put that in a for loop here. Okay, here's the initialization statement. Here's the test statement, num less than or equal to max number. And here's that increment num plus plus. And so that's going to run once for one, then again for two, again for three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And then eventually we're going to hit 11 as our count value. Um, that's greater than or equal to 10. So that kicks us out of the loop. And in fact, in this case, ends our program. Okay. So you can walk through this, hopefully. Uh, we initialize, we test, we run this statement, then we update and go back to the test. And as long as it passes the test, we go back to the output statement and back to the update. And that just continues ad, not ad infinitum because this is not an infinite loop eventually num 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 plus plus is going to get us an 11 that kicks us out of the loop okay uh, when to use the for loop any situation that clearly requires an initialization and provides a condition to stop the loop and provides an update that occurs at the end of each iteration. Okay, um, any of those things could be done with a while loop, but they can also be done with the, the for loop, um, and the for loop is just a lot tidier. Note the for loop, like the while loop, is a pretest loop. Okay, 
it's going to test the middle expression, count less than or equal to 10, um, before each iteration. So this loop that starts us out at 11 and tests for is count less than or equal to 10, that's never going to print any output. It's going to kick us out of the loop before we even start and we never get any, we never get to say hello. Isn't that sad? Um, for loop is, again, as I said, very powerful in C languages. Um, this first expression, the initialization, um, just like an initialization statement anywhere else in C++ can actually have multiple variables go, you know, firing at once. So X may happen to be your loop control variable, but you can initialize Y at the same time. Um, you can also have multiple statements in the update expression. X may be your loop control variable, but you can increment Y at the same time. And they don't have to go in the same direction. You could, you could minus minus Y here so that you're counting up with X and counting down with Y. Um, one fun little trick, you can omit the initialization expression if it's already been done. Um, if you decided to initialize num up here anyway, then there's no need to do it down here. Um, you can also, and this is a very common trick, you can declare a new variable in the initialization expression. Okay, no need to put int num up here if you're never going to use num anywhere but in the uh, in the for loop. But note that if you if you do leave the initialization here to the first step of the for loop, the scope of the variable num is the for loop, okay? It, it is in scope during this loop, and as soon as something kicks us out of the loop, no more num, okay? It's out of scope. Um, <clears throat> One use of a for loop is to keep a running total. No, sorry, that's not a for loop. This is a while loop. Um, I thought we were going to give another for loop example here. Sorry. Um, one use of loops in general is to keep a running total. Uh, so in this case, we have something called an accumulator, which is a variable that accumulates values as we go through. So we're going to add the first 10 numbers in... Uh, in the set of integers, so or the set of, of positive integers. So we start with num equals 1. Um, while num is less than or equal to 10, we add num to sum, and then we increment num and come back here. Okay, so we'll add 1, and then we'll add 2, and then we'll add 3, and then we'll add 4, and eventually we'll get to 11, and that will kick us out of the loop and we'll sum and we'll print sum of numbers 1 to 10 is um, and we'll use that sum that we've been accumulating in our loop. Okay. Um, so here the, uh, the user is inputting a number of days for which they have sales amounts for a company. Uh, and then from one to days, counting with a plus plus so that we capture every day, uh, the person's going to enter the sales amount, and then we're going to take sales and plus it to total. Okay. Uh, and so total is going to accumulate the total amount that this person sold for however many days. And once we, once we are greater than the number of days, um, we come out here and we see out um, the total sales are blah. Okay, 
Um, so that's a an accumulator value. There's another kind of value that we use in loops called a sentinel value. A sentinel is a value in a list of values that indicates we've reached the end. Okay. Um, this works only in situations where there are certain values that are clearly illegal. Okay. Um, if you're inputting test scores for students on a exam, presumably a student cannot do so badly on the exam that they get a negative score. So uh, any negative number would be a sentinel value indicating that we're, we're done with our data. Uh, if you uh, were inputting uh, names of people in the class and trying to build a, a class list, presumably no one is going to have the name Z, 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 Z. Okay, so you could have the person type Z, 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 Z as a sentinel for we've reached the end of the list. Or you could have the person type a blank line as the sentinel for we've reached the end because nobody has um, a blank name. Okay. So here is a um, soccer score counter. We're going to enter the points that we earned on various games. It's impossible to earn a negative score in soccer, so um, negative one is going to be our sentinel value. And so while points does not equal negative one, we're going to uh, add the number of points to our total. So there's an accumulator. We're going to read in the new points. We're going to come back here and check that the points was not negative one. And we have to tell the user somewhere, enter negative one when finished, so that um, they know it's, uh, that that's how they end the input. Uh, we've already used a sentinel value in our uh, calculator program when we asked the user to type Q for quit. Okay. Uh, deciding which loop to use. This is sometimes a little tricky for new programmers. Um, you maybe want to use a while loop for everything and you forget that you can use a for loop or um, maybe you jump to a for loop for everything um, when it's not always appropriate to do so. Uh, the while loop is a conditional pretest loop. Iterates as long as a certain condition exists. Great for validating input, great for reading lists of data terminated by a sentinel. Though again, the way C++ structures its for loop, you could use a for loop for that as well. Um, you just say uh, for uh, input equals blank, um, input does not equal, you know, you can say for input equals zero, input does not equal negative one. You know. um, get next input. Um, so there, there are ways to adapt while loops to for loops in C++. There are ways to adapt any for loop to a while loop. So um, there's nothing you can't do with a while loop. So it's a, a good, very simple loop for someone who's just getting started to use for everything. But eventually you'll learn that there are certain situations where do while um, does you a little bit better because you always want to iterate through the, uh, the process at least once. Um, oftentimes this, this works great for programs where you want to do it once and you're sure that if the user ran your program, they want to do it once. And then you can ask them, do you want to do it again? And um, yeah, that's a, an excellent use for those. Uh, the for loop is another pretest loop, but it's got these built-in expressions for initializing, testing, and updating. Uh, it's most commonly used in situations where an exact number of iterations is known. Okay, you're iterating through a list. You know there are 10 items in the list. Let's do it. Okay, um, you don't have to know the exact number when you start the program. If you remember that one, a couple of uh, slides ago, the, the salesperson entered how many uh, Uh, how many sales numbers they had, 
or uh, the soccer team where they entered uh, how many um, times they had, you know, how many games they wanted to play. You can do that. Those were while loops, but you can do that with a for loop as, as well. You can ask somebody to enter how many times you want to, to input data and then say for uh, iteration equals zero iteration less than number of times iteration plus plus and and do your input loop that way um, situations where a particular event needs to happen every time until a stop condition is met okay and this is where um, you can do a c plus plus for loop where you say um, for um, you know input equals read your file once um, while uh, not end of file um, read the next input okay and then all you would have to do here is say see out input end line Okay, and this would read one line of input, output it to the console, read the next line of input, and as long as you didn't just hit an end of file, it'll come here and write. So that's that's a simple code right there for printing an entire file to the screen. Okay. Nested loops. Okay. Just as with ifs and else's we can nest loops inside other loops okay so we talk about an inner loop being the inside part and an outer loop being the outside part um, that isn't to say that you can only have two um, there can be an outer and a middle and an inner you can have as many levels of loop nesting as you really want um, this is an example of a nested loop that processes a three row four column matrix so if we have numbers, number, 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 three rows by four columns, okay, um, we're going to go through and say for row equals one, column equals one, see out row times column, then column plus plus, so we move over to the next column, C out, move over to the next column, move over to the next column, and when we run out of columns, then instead of kicking us out of the loop entirely, hitting column greater than or equal, you know, hitting column more than four kicks us out to the outer loop. And so now we go through and we row plus plus, so we're now on row two, and then we start this inner loop again, column equals one, column equals two, three, four, run out of columns, so that kicks us out here, we row plus plus again, and we're on this row, row three, boom, 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 run out of columns, kick us back out here, now we've run out of rows, and that kicks us out of the whole nested loop situation. Okay. So this is an example of a program that's designed to let a uh, teacher average all of their students' test grades. So uh, the teacher would have to, you know, before we get to the for loop, the teacher would have to enter how many students there are, okay, and they'd have to enter how many tests there are. So we would presumably up here have code that says CN num students, CN num tests, okay, let the user, you know, user tell us how many students they have and how many tests they, they want to grade. And then we're going to say, okay, student starts out as one, 
as long as student is less than or equal to num students, we're going to enter a sub loop. Okay, we're going to set the total equal to zero. So we've got an accumulator here. Okay, um, for uh, we're going to set test equal to one, and as long as test is less than num tests, um, we're going to go through this process of entering a score for the student. User inputs a score. We add score to total. So there's we're, we're accumulating in our accumulator. Eventually, uh, test plus plus gets us more than the number of tests. That kicks us out of this inner loop. And we're going to say average is total divided by num tests. That's how you calculate an average. Um, we output the average. And then we loop back to student plus plus. And for the next student, as long as we're less than or equal to number of students, for the next student, we enter this inner loop and we do all of this stuff again. And eventually we'll run out of students. And when student plus plus gets greater than number of students, that kicks us out of the whole loop, the whole outer loop. And we, uh, we run on with whatever is left of the program if there is any. Okay, note that the inner loop goes through all repetitions each time the outer loop repeats. Okay, so if the inner loop has four repetitions and the outer loop has three, then for the first repetition of the outer loop, you go four times. For the next repetition of the outer loop, you go four times to the inner loop. Okay, uh, that is the inner loop doesn't have to execute the same number of times every time. Okay, it can be uh, if, if you're doing something funny with each name each letter of a person's name, the outer loop may read the names and the inner loop may step through each letter in the person's name. So that, does, that means that um, for James, you would do the inner loop three times. For Samantha, you do it more times. For uh, Bob, you do it only three times. Okay. Uh, the inner loop repetitions will complete sooner than the outer loop. So as soon as you're finished with the inner loop, you kick back out to the outer loop. Eventually, the outer loop will finish um, and the total number of repetitions for the inner loop is the number of repetitions of the inner times the outer. That's, that's if the inner loop runs the same number of times every time. If it's the counting through people's names thing, uh, you would have to add up uh, James plus Samantha plus Bob, and that would be the total number of repetitions for the inner loop. Okay. The last thing we're going to talk about, and this is a little bit disjointed here, is um, how we use files in C++ for data storage. It's not entirely disjointed because you can't really process a file without using a loop, but um, at the same time, it's uh, it's a little little different topic here. Okay, we can in C++ use files instead of the console terminal for program input and output. Um, this allows data to be retained between program runs because as we know the program data is stored in memory and memory disappears as soon as the program finishes running. There are typically three steps in any file usage. You have to open the file for read or write access you have to use the file, read from it or write to it, or in some cases you can do both. Um, and then you close the file so that it gets flushed to the, uh, to the disk if you've been writing to it, or so that it just becomes available for someone else to read from it if you've been using it for reading. Okay, you're going to use the fstream header file, so pound include fstream for file access, and there are two kinds, uh, input file stream, output file stream. There's also F stream in general, if you're going to be doing input or output to a file and you're, you're not sure which, or, or you're doing a mix of input and output to the file. Uh, you're gonna define file stream objects um, this way. Um, ifstream in file, ofstream out file. 
obviously in file and out file are just um, example names. You can call your files anything you want. Um, however, using in file and out file is certainly uh, legal in C++ and it helps you keep track of, of what exactly you're doing. Okay, as we said, the first step in using any file is to open it. You create a link between the file name, which is, you know, the file is outside the program on a disk somewhere, and a file stream object, which is inside the program in memory. And to link those, you use the dot open member function. Okay, the simplest way to do this is to say dot open and present your file name, but Oftentimes, you don't want the um, file name to be in whatever the current working directory is that the you know, operating system may have arbitrarily chosen. Um, so you can use full path info, okay? If you're on a Windows machine, a full path is F colon backslash, um, you know, drive letter, you know, drive letter colon backslash, um, as many folders as you want, ending with backslash file name. If you're in a Unix-based system, which includes Mac OS these days, um, you do these forward slashes, and you start with what's called the root level of your operating system and or of your hard drive, and then you provide users, jcamp, documents, outputs.csv. Okay. Uh, the output file will be created if necessary. If there is an existing file of the same name, it will be erased first. Okay, so be careful about that. Um, if you set your program up to always use the same file name, it will always keep erasing the output from the previous run um, and, and printing out and overwriting it with a new file. Um, the, input fi the input file must already exist for open to work, otherwise open will fail. Fortunately, you can test that. Um, in file will be set to a true value if open worked. It will be set to a false value if there was any kind of failure. So you can actually do a little if statement here. Um, if not in file, then we'll tell the user that there was a, a failure mode. You can also use infile.fail to tell you whether the most recent infile operation was a failure. Um, the output file object uses the stream insertion operator that we learned for C out. Um, the input file object uses the stream extraction operator that we learned for C in. And just as with CN and C out, you can use multiple of these on the same line to read multiple values in one line of code. And just as with C out, you can stick in new line characters to insert new, new lines into your text file so that uh, inventory report appears on a, on a line by itself and then there's another line under it that would uh, get the first line of inventory. Okay, uh, the stream extraction operator is going to, that, that whole line is going to return true when a value was successfully read and false if it's not. So we can say while input file read number, okay, um, and as long as we read a number from the file, we can keep doing, you know, uh, use number. And then as soon as we run out of numbers, uh, when input file hits the end of, end of file, uh, this is going to return false, and that'll kick us out of the while loop, and, and we'll be done with the, we'll know we're done with the file. What happens when we are done with the file? The good citizen thing to do is to close it. Now your program will close the files or the operating system will close the files for you whenever your program exits at the end. So if you forget, it won't leave the user's system in limbo, presumably. However, it's just not a good thing to do. Um, 
there may be a limit on the number of open files that the system is allowing, and you may be screwing that up for somebody else. Um, there may be buffered output data waiting to be sent to the file, and the operating system is not going to write that out if it closes the file automatically for you. So calling close um, forces a file write and, and makes anything left in the buffer get sent to the file. Uh, in C++11, you can pass a string object as an argument to the file streams open function. Okay, So you can have the user enter the file name, see out enter the file name, user enters a file name, and then you pass that file name right down here to input file.open. Um, then we're being a good responsible you know, programmer here and saying if input file um, go into our reading loop, okay? Um, and we use that little trick here, while input file to number, we'll see out the number. Uh, so we're just gonna print a list of numbers to the console. Um, thought exercise, see if you can think of how you would rearrange this as a for loop, because you can do that um, to get the uh, input file to number um, to work that way, but uh, okay. Prior to C++11, so if you're using a really old compiler, um, the open member function required a C, a null terminated C string, okay? So in C, not C++, strings are recorded this way. Um, N A M E are recorded as individual characters in an array, and then a slash zero character, a null character, is printed at the end because the C string didn't automatically end at the end of that uh, thing. It usually kept on going because you never knew how long your string was going to need to be. So, um, this is called a C string, and you can get the C string from a C++ string by calling the dot C string member function. There are a couple of times in C++ where you find yourself wanting to use an old C library function, um, and so you may need to get this C string extracted from your string object, okay? All right, last thing, and I hesitate to bring this up because it's considered bad programming, but there are cases where it helps you. Um, you can use break to terminate execution of a loop. So uh, if you have five steps in your loop and on the third step, you happen to know that the loop is just, there's no point in continuing with the rest of the loop, you can use break and that kicks you out of the loop forever. Uh, of course, when using an inner loop, that, that breaks you back out to the outer loop. It doesn't break you out of both loops. Uh, continue is used a little more commonly in C++, and that's where if you have five steps that you have to go through in your loop, and it turns out on step three, you know that you don't have to do the next two steps this time through the loop. You can say continue, and it'll go up to the loop uh, statement and continue with the next uh, the next test and you know, update test and repeat uh, for a for loop. Uh, break and continue are kind of frowned upon because they make the program logic hard to follow. It's not always easy to predict whether a break or a continue will happen, and so um, most uh, most responsible programmers just use an if statement to, to break out those statements that don't have to happen every loop or something instead. Okay, that's it for loops. Um, we'll be back again, uh, I'll be back again tomorrow with a uh, uh, the next installment on, I think we're going into functions next. If you learned something from this, leave me a like, and if you have any comments, feel free to leave those in the comments below. Thank you very much.